to be the idea. Hi, Helani. Hi, Hi Hernani. Hi, Maurice. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I can't turn my camera on, but I'm guessing that will be enabled later. Yeah. Sorry? I can't turn my camera on myself. I'm guessing that will be enabled later because it says uh, the host does not allow you to enable the camera. Uh, no, I have to give you the permission. So right now I'm giving it to you. Okay. And I think I can see Tom has a hand up for a question. Uh, okay. Thomas. I'm trying to mute Thomas, but I don't know what's going on. Okay. Okay, that's better. Sorry about that. I muted myself by accident. That's why I went completely quiet. <laughs> now I can lower my hand. Yeah, Maurice, um, Pablo is the only person with access to, to that. Um, can you hear me now, uh, Pablo? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So can you enable my camera as well? Yes, one second. The only thing that you have to know it supposedly only one person can be talking at this. Like, if you are not talking, I have to mute you. And same with the camera. Yeah, that's good. I believe it's here as well. Hello, Philip. Can you hear me? Hey. Morning. Morning. Nice. Well, it looks like all participants this side of the world looks with small eyes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good night, Philip. No, Good I'm evening. Philip. Yes. Hello. Where? Uh, Pablo, Mike, I still don't have my camera. Yes, I just give you the permission right now. I'm not sure if the other co-hosts are... Uh, turn it off your cameras. Can you tell me, please? I'm not sure. Shall we turn our cameras off? No. It, it's possible that all the participants have always the camera on. It is possible. Was that a question or an ask? It, a, for, uh, for a question to the room manager. A question. I think it will be easier if all of you have the camera on. One quick. All of you turn off your own camera because I am not seeing you right now. Okay, now I see. You, you don't see me? Actually, I, I see me. Okay, no. Now I see Hernan and Thomas, and that's it. 
Yeah, but it's working, no problem. Okay, perfect. So, do we leave the camera on or? Yes, that's the idea, Maurice, when, when we start in, in, in five, that we, we have the cameras on since we are the ones to, uh, to see our faces right now. And they are recording it, so. Is Leonida here as well? Is she joining us? Yes, uh, she, she, she is. She is. She is. She uh, is planned to join us. She is in China, so she was having some of uh, her own connection issues, but she was or she is uh, confirmed. She's confirmed. Okay, and she's joining. Helani, just to. Uh, uh, well, and Maurice, since we had the call yesterday, I think we got the timings wrong and counted for three. It would be three minutes each if there were three of us, but there's there's four of us. So try just to keep in mind to try and keep comment responses to each answer to about two and a half minutes. Sure. Um, so Pablo, I, I notice if I go mute, I can't unmute myself. I, I have to send a request. So okay. Is it that we should just leave microphone and cameras open? Yeah, Perfect. same with me. If I mute, I can't unmute. And I think also if I go off camera, I can't come back on. So where, once uh, you let me on, Pablo, I will be on camera. Right now I'm off. All right, as soon as it's your time to talk, I will let you, uh, let you turn on your camera and your microphone. Okay, we are starting in two minutes, but for you to know, we are live right now. Um, this is a manager of the room two. I'm Tina, and uh, Miss Leonida told me that she is here. Yes. She's not on the participants list, though, is she? Here in the um, room. Uh, Ms. Leonida is in, uh, uh, come to the uh, meeting room in person. Oh, okay, perfect. Yep. Hang on. Okay. Uh, hey guys, I'm here in the room, so um, when it's my turn to speak, just let me know. <laughs> uh, hello, hey, Leo. Hello. Hey, how are you? Uh, very well, I can't see you. Um, I don't know where I need to start. I have to go on stage to, to let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> then, then you'll see me. Hi. Hello. Tom, Maurice, can you see me? Um, in the distance, in the, with a massive face of Philip behind you. 
I'm physically oh yeah, yeah, you're at the podium. You're at the podium now, right? Yeah. So when it's my ah. turn, okay. Yeah. Well, you're, you're you're representing the entire global south with your presence there. <laughs> <laughs> For this project, anyway. Yeah. Okay. So I'll. I'll is it only Hernan and myself who, I don't know, now I see Maurice. Hi, Maurice. Hi, Hernan. Hi, Hi Philip. Please stay awake for the next hour and we will make it. Okay. I already had my, my morning coffee. Well, if it's only one, then you're just doing five. I will probably need a new one. I believe so too. <laughs> okay, Tom, I think we can start now. It's already the time. Okay. Well, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to this session. Um, I'm going to hand over to Philip to introduce the session first before we get into our panel discussion. So Philip, over to you for welcoming remarks and an introduction. Wonderful and good morning and afternoon, everyone. I'm happy that we are finally here at the UN World Data Forum. And uh, today we will talk about the SDG Acceleration Roadmap Initiative and why we as a consortia are exploring the role of business in supporting public sector data use. So first of all, we have seen a shift in how companies do business and with far more focus right now on environmental and social impact, which has been actually a driver for us uh, to bring a closer relationship between public-private collaboration with the data revolution community, especially on how we can trigger the work of companies, national statistical offices, civil society, among others, to contribute to accelerate the SDGs. So companies are actually helping in some cases to fill uh, public data gaps, to transfer also knowledge and uh, the expertise to support use for decision making. This is something that has happened already way before the so-called data revolution, but with just seven years that we have to go, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to achieve the SDG, we need certainly uh, more timely data to ensure that first the private sector is a true and meaningful partner in this data revolution by contributing to the SDGs. In particular, this role, we see this in the Global South as a vital and pivotal uh, of importance that we have the right enabling environment for public-private uh, partnerships. So we need to understand, and this is one of our main questions here, on how um, we need how we need to understand the extent and how the private sector has contributed to the data revolution. So we are here today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in. Since uh, 2021, CEPE, uh, the institution I direct in Colombia, works on a consortium with uh, IDRC supported um, with LDRI, uh, the Caribbean Open Institute of the University of the West Indies uh, in Jamaica, and the Center for Continuing Education from the Versailles University. And this is all coordinated with our partners from Linasia. So what is our aim uh, and what have we been doing before I hand over to my colleagues? First of all, we aim to understand uh, how far the private sector really data related uh, contributions to the public policy in the global south really extend and how and what is the private sector doing to make more and more and better data to achieve and monitor the SDGs in the global south. So we had a two phase approach within the consortium that I just presented. First of all, we had a structured mapping of 
those relationships that companies uh, support the SDGs through data. And secondly, and this is part of what our colleagues will be presenting today, are case studies on how actually companies are working together uh, with NSOs and others uh, to present the insights and the trends today. And this is why we have put together this panel so that Elani Galapaglia, the Chief Executive Officer from Linasia, Hernan Munoz, our research associate uh, from CEPE, uh, also Leonida Mutuku from LDRI in Kenya, and Maurice uh, McNaughton from uh, the universities of the West Indies what will be uh, contributing their ideas, their knowledge, and also their very in-depth uh, knowledge of what is happening in the five regions where we did our research. And the lead on this, uh, it's Tom Morell, who has been coordinating this group, and this is why he, of course, is moderating today's panel. I'm happy uh, that we finally made it here to the UN World Data Forum and to turn over the mic uh, to Tom. Good morning to you, Tom. Tom, are you here with me? Hi. If if the organizers can help me and let me know if Tom Orell is on the line, he he has been heard because I cannot. Thomas, I see that you are online. Can you talk to us, please? I think we are having uh, some communication issues at this uh, moment. Uh, if uh, we persist, uh, I would like uh, to invite our first speaker, uh, my colleague uh, Elani Calpaya, uh, to make her first introductory remarks until we find uh, Tom back um, here to the stage. Good morning to you, Elani, as well. Good to see you. Thank you, Philip. Um, so I think we were going to do a quick introduction on what were some of the key findings uh, from the region. And as you know, the uh, four regions present here did both a mapping study as well as uh, some in-depth case studies. And ah, there is Tom. Uh, I can see him, but should I continue? I can hear now. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Someone's changed something, but thank you very much. My apologies for interrupting. Do you want to uh, give some comments and we start or shall I just continue, Tom? Could you not hear me at all when I gave some comments? No, nobody could hear us at all. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies. Um, I don't know what happened there. I, it appeared as unmuted on my screen. All I was saying was good morning to everyone and thank you very much, Philip, for those opening remarks. Um, Helani, I don't want to interrupt your flow, so let's stick with Helani. Um, the first question I imagine everybody is aware of now, which is to please just give us a bit of an overview of the research that you've been undertaking and to describe some of the key key findings that you'd like to highlight today. So please, Helani, over to you. Thanks, Tom. Um, so um, what we found, um, you know, we did both the mapping study where we looked at a very regional level, what are the data actions that are going on in the Asia Pacific, and then we looked at some in-depth case studies, and maybe I'll pick up on the latter. Um, and we, we looked at two types of partnerships or two types of organizations, and to highlight the importance and the role that they can play in data for SDGs. Um, so one is the really large global companies who we see are quite involved and we see them at even some of these meetings, right? The large global companies are really well placed to work across the region and even globally on many of the data partnerships that we are interested in. 
not just sharing data, but capacity building and so on. So includes, uh, you know, um, really includes capacity building for governments, civil society, providing software and tools, helping analyze data, providing technical expertise, setting policy and so on. And also share, um, developing data standards to be shared, to be used by others. So in this respect, uh, big companies can do things that many others can't. So one of our examples was Microsoft, which has a large number of data actions and partnerships going on around the Asia Pacific and for a really long time, right? 10, 20 years. And they talk about their ability to go into a country, invest in the whole ecosystem, whether it's the ICT ecosystem or the data ecosystem, help develop the skills, improve digital and data literacy and so on. These are all long term activities, but for a company of that sort of long standing stature and size, uh, there's also a realistic long term payoff because the more digitally literate, for example, the people are, the more likely that they will also sell some of their products. So, you know, because they are one of the largest software and cloud service providers. Now, of course, later on, we should talk about what that means in terms of small companies participating. But the big companies can really bring a lot to table and take that long-term payoff. But the long-term benefits are great, but for any company, particularly the big ones, to sustain this kind of engagement over decades on data, right? Not just months and years. There has to be a real serious commitment to these data partnerships. Um, and it has to be inside. And that's the only way it works. Microsoft, for example, is explicit in their commitment to data for SDGs and communicates it out. The commitment inside is inside as well as outside the organization. Uh, of course, there can be serious risks, uh, reputational, financial, ethical, also associated with giving out their data or working in partnership, uh, particularly in partnerships that are not necessarily tied with serious contracts, but are more in contributions in the partnerships. So the big companies, they provide standardized ways of understanding, evaluating, and mitigating these risks when within business units, when, our, when some of their business units want to engage in data partnerships. My final point is a completely different type of organization, and those are the third parties that can broker and facilitate and really create and sustain a data ecosystem. And in this example, we looked at uh, UN uh, Pulse Lab Jakarta. It was set under the UN uh, system in partnership with the government of India to accelerate innovations around data. Now, being part of the UN system, which brings a lot of sort of slow moving bureaucracy, but it also gives a level of trust to companies and to government when they want to work with each other. So they can sit in the middle bring organizations into the mix. They can also bring other in multilateral organizations like the ILO into the mix. Uh, and the private sector tends to trust them perhaps a little bit more. But to generalize broader from Pulse Lab Jakarta is the idea that third party brokers play a vital role not only in the introduction and setting up of partnerships, but also in the technical facilitation of pooling data, sharing data, and sometimes even providing analytical data. One of the big challenges for private companies is commercially sensitive data being given to one party, particularly if that's the only private sector company that is participating and giving data. But if a third party player can pool more data, strip away and anonymize and pseudonymize some of the commercially sensitive data, the large set of data that they pool together can be really useful. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Helani. Two very different and very interesting case studies, and I, I, I'd love to find out more about what you learned through them and, and, and um, what they mean, I guess, for the larger ecosystem when we get around to it. But before we do that, let's hear from, from our other panelists as well about the research that they've been undertaking. Herman, um, perhaps you could um, share some insights from your research too. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Tom. Well, as uh, maybe was repeated from the beginning, our main question during this uh, this research was what what is actually the private sector doing in uh, our regions to to make uh, um, the data available to achieve and monitor the SDGs in the global south? And it, and in this sense, what we have found is that uh, 
we first mapped these 44 data initiatives that are di distributed uh, within 14 Latin American countries. And from this uh, uh, mapping exercise, uh, we can conclude that not, not many private initiatives has, have been systematically uh, incorporating into the data ecosystems for, for the SDGs in the countries. And uh, we could say that the SDGs have not yet had the expected catalytic effect that uh, it, it was expected to. Uh, so the, this mapping reinforced that con conclusion in the sense that uh, the data ecosystems in Latin America still have low participation from, from, from the private sector, which, which implies somehow an uh, under-exploitation of the potential of the data revolution to, to increase the capacities to monitor and, 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 and achieve the SDG agenda. So uh, I, I, I would say that there are data and there are initiatives. That, that's one main, main uh, finding. That there is still a lack of data initiatives in, in, in general. The companies in general are leaning toward more reporting their own impact on the SDGs through data collection and analysis. But this does not necessarily imply an, a strengthening of the data ecosystems for, for the SDGs. And in some cases, uh, the companies mostly disseminate reports on their environment and, and the impact. Uh, and they accompany their databases. But this is not necessarily strengthening the, the data ecosystems. But in the case of private and public uh, partnerships, it, it, it is useful to distinguish between those partnerships that seek to uh, identify the potential of an alternative data source uh, to measure a specific phenomena and partnerships with, that aim uh, to measure them on a regular basis. And in this sense, we have found, uh, we have worked on two case studies. The first one is uh, on, on the INI Chile that provided insights um, um, into partnership between several Chilean retail companies that uh, share scanner data with the National Statistical Office, the INE Chile, and th that combines this data with traditional surveys data to uh, model and produce the consumer price index. And then INE now, now has uh, been working with uh, four major retail conglomerates, and they think they can, uh, the scanner data can provide up to 40% of the data needed to the INE to recalculate the to, to do the calculation of the CPI. So in this sense, what we have found is that there is a, a, a reduction of cost for, for the NSO in the, in, in, the, in the CPA survey operation. There is new information about consumer data that uh, has still to be explored because this is a, a, a massive amount of data in, 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 in comparison with the actual survey that they do in the field. Uh, there is the possibility of a more active cooperation with con uh, with companies once they have opened this door of cooperating with the public with the private sector from the NSO, and and this exploration uh, uh, and uh, introduces a, a work with high volume of of, of works. Uh, so they have developed in the in the team own skills uh, own skills also in terms of storage capacities, uh, streamlining a process on how to enhance uh, private health uh, data. And there is also the possibility to have uh, real-time data that is uh, what, what, what uh, the data revolution is uh, in, in, in many cases looking for. So uh, in, the, in this case, in this association between the, the, the INE as uh, an NSO, as a public sector and the private, I would say that uh, a key success factor is associated with uh, the strategy used by them to engage with the companies. In the case of the Chile, of the INE, they uh, uh, took advantage of existing contacts uh, with uh, reporting forecast points in the company uh, because they used to have a relationship uh, for other statistics um, that the INE produces. So these people were already new on working protocols. Uh, other companies are more reticent, uh, but more. But uh, this is another learning process because there was a herd effect that was generated as, as, as more companies showing it in sharing their scanner data. And uh, I think that barriers of mistrust have been broken down and, and the, the implementation of learning has, has been perfected in that sense. And it's an, a, a working process. There's one more lesson in, in, in this sense 
uh, that it was COVID. The COVID pandemic was the catalyst for that accelerated all these processes uh, of using uh, private health uh, data and uh, the NSOs have to find a way to continue with uh, their statistical operations. So um, I, I think that in this sense, um, from now on, uh, actually, they will need to have concrete actions to promote the data sharing and generate an, an environment of trust, because now the, the pandemic uh, is no longer operating as a catalyst uh, for accelerating this. Our other case, and I will be a little bit brief on this, is I, a know, case... I think uh, yeah. we're, we're quite a lot over time, so if you could be very, very brief, just to highlight a couple sure, of yeah. points. Sure, yeah. You continue with the other cases. Are you sure? We can. Yeah, sure. Okay, we'll come back to you and you can elaborate a little bit more on the, the, the recommendations perhaps from, um, from your second case study too. But Maurice, um, over to you to please um, also share some insights from the Caribbean region. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, good night again, colleagues. Um, so like uh, my other colleagues from the other areas of the Global South, um, we also conducted a mapping exercise for several countries in the Caribbean and uh, selected a particular case study that was quite interesting in our context. So the case study that we had for the Caribbean was based on the Trust for the Americas. Um, it's a nonprofit organization that's affiliated with the Organization of American States and was established uh, to, in a deliberate effort to promote public-private partnerships. So in some sense, the DNA of the Trust for Americas lends itself uh, quite well um, to this kind of um, engagement between the public and the private sector. In fact, it's, uh, as we found from the case study, the Trust was uniquely suited for convening and mobilizing private sector actors around a development agenda. Because on the one hand, they are affiliated with and support the OAS mandate. And then on the other hand, they have this kind of um, private sector um, engagement. Uh, we found the particular initiative that we studied was around digital and data capacity building. And that currently has pretty strong resonance in the Caribbean in terms of policy agenda priorities. Um, I would just very briefly summarize uh, three key findings uh, from the case done. Um, first of all, we found that the trust role as a convener was instrumental in creating conditions and the enabling environment for mobilizing and establishing effective public-private partnerships. So their role as a convener was actually quite important and something of a catalyst for a number of um, relationships that emerged. Um, the second thing I would mention as, a, as an insight was that they built up significant social capital and relationships over a period of time. And that was quite important um, to leverage in terms of their ongoing ability to engage the private sector and to mobilize private partnerships between the public and private sector. So that sort of um, social capital is important and it's, it's actually quite difficult to, 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 to substitute for. Um, the third key point I'd make, Tom, and we'll probably come back to this later in recommendations, is the idea that uh, a, a deliberate ecosystem approach that facilitates multiple actors participating in these um, initiatives is quite important. So uh, traditionally, one thinks of public-private partnerships as largely bilateral arrangements. Um, but in this case, because the trust had a kind of convener role, then it created a possibility of engaging multiple partners around a, a single type of initiative. And, and that really does lend itself quite well to uh, scalable and ultimately self-sustaining um, uh, environment for data for development. So I think those are three th key insights that emerged and uh, perhaps uh, we can talk some more about the uh, some of the recommendations that emerged from those uh, those insights. So back over Thank to you, Tom. Thank you so much, Maurice. That's excellent and really interesting. There are some really interesting themes emerging, and I'll summarize those in a moment. Um, but before doing that, um, last but not least, our final panelist, Leonida, who is in the room. Um, so, Leonida, please, over to you. Uh, 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Leonida, and I'm representing the Africa, the Sub-Saharan Africa case study. So um, we, uh, just like the other regions mentioned, also did a mapping uh, of similar projects around the region. And the one that I'll be highlighting today is particularly about um, uh, a, region, uh, a partnership between a regional government in Kenya and three private sector companies to, to develop a GIS SDG lab um, using earth observation data. So um, the government is Vihiga County, which is a subnational government in Kenya. And just like all other subnational governments are mandated by the constitution to enact legislature to uh, manage budgets, but also to, to do planning and implementation of strategic development projects. So um, the Vihiga County, which is what we call a subnational uh, government regions, uh, partnered together with um, Air Airbus, um, the European uh, company, as well as uh, Locate IT, a startup based in Kenya, and ESRI to build a JS lab that basically put together observation data and remote sensing data to support planning and implementation of sustainable development goals within this regional um, area. And so this partnership was established about, I would say, 10 years ago and has been ongoing. And the idea was that um, the county would provide the you know the facilities the land to set up the lab where airbus would provide the data for remote sensing uh, it would provide the technology while um, esri would also provide software to analyze this gis data now um, based on this partnership uh, and our case study we learned a number of things um, for such an intricate and very um, technical um, support around um, data for development uh, it requires uh, political will. So was it not for the governor or the head of this county having a JS background and being um, spearheading rather and championing this initiative, most likely such a collaboration to use data, private data for development might not have um, come to the fore. Secondly, um, there needed to be clear incentives for each of these partners, primarily because, as you're seeing, all these resources are donated uh, by each of these partners. And so for the private sector companies, it was um, a good opportunity to showcase proof of concept that um, these uh, private data um, and remote sensing data can be applied on a um, periodic basis to support sustainable development goals. And then um, finally, the one thing that uh, we also learned was that there was need to institutionalize um, these kinds of partnerships. So because uh, in as much as there's goodwill to get it going, uh, such a project is likely to collapse and uh, the, you know, the flow of data comes to an end if there's no um, institutionalization of um, the process of obtaining the data and utilizing it for decision making. The county government of Vihiga had to um, create policies and actually establish a department within the government that oversees the the running of these um, JS labs. However, again, uh, because of the high um, level of effort to establish these initial partnerships, the likelihood for it to scale throughout the other 46 counties in Kenya is also an uphill task. And so um, this it's a very niche collaboration with high impact and uh, Unfortunately, ability can be called into question. And so um, the final thing also um, observed about this was that in spite of that, the fact that the data provided is sector agnostic, so it can be used for early warning uh, for food and nutrition in this county, but at the same time, it is also being used for maternal health um, 
planning uh, for for to to make sure that um, prenatal and antenatal care is um, you know is taken um, as needed by various mothers within the county. Like these use cases were solid enough to ensure that those cross collaboration and to to maximize the utility of the data being produced by this lab. So. Um, we will talk about challenges and recommendations um, as the conversation continues. Leonida, while we have you there, actually, stay at the podium. Don't, don't move. <laughs> um, while we have you there, perhaps, um, I was just going to say, perhaps we could segue into those recommendations. So if you could perhaps highlight just mm -hmm. one or maximum two recommendations very briefly um, mm -hmm. that have emerged from the work that you've done. That would be really excellent. And then we can come back to our virtual colleagues as well. Okay, so one of our recommendations is tied to the um, to to the findings that we got, which was that uh, these kinds of partnerships don't have, um, you know, indefinite longevity if they're not institutionalized. And so having government actually put more skin in the game by actually providing a budget and having a specific department to manage this lab beyond the, um, the period of the collaboration um, is very key to ensure that this private sector data is continually funded for and can be utilized for development goals um, will be one of the recommendations. and. Uh, Tied to this would also be the need to capacitate the county itself to also utilize, um, or rather to have the necessary skills to maintain this lab, not just um, relying on these private sector actors to, to keep the lab running. But that then brings another recommendation, which I, I wouldn't say is a recommendation per se, but a question we have up in the air that we would want uh, these partners to think about the issue of vendor locking. So these private sector companies, of course, are here to promote their own products, Airbus, Locate IT, Esri. But if we want to bring in other collaborators into the project, like there needs to be a way to move the partnership to a more abstracted uh, position such that other players, um, other providers of these technologies can also support the lab uh, as and when is needed and that there's no single point of failure from just one um, specific data provider or technology provider. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. And I'm sure we're, we're going to come back to, to some of these themes. Already we've heard from our other panelists as well, the importance of establishing that enabling environment of having that interlocutor effect, whether it's through government or a, a third party. Um, and obviously that very close tie between skills and um, knowledge and the data itself. So with, with these reflections and thoughts in mind, um, perhaps we can come back to Helani now as well to just share very briefly one or two key recommendations that emerged from her case studies um, and, and tell us a little bit more about them. Sure. Thanks, Tom. I think the first one is about inten intentionality. Data partnerships, particularly ones around data sharing, are hard, and or too often we see one-off or siloed efforts. Leo talked about the difficulty of going beyond a single county and scaling up. One government department will enter a long negotiation with a private company for data, and it doesn't go beyond that. So to think, to think about the partnership and how it will evolve over time is, I think, really important, and how it will scale up is important. Second is to recognize that when it comes to data sharing, there's value in one company partnering with civil society or government, but there's a lot more value for all parties if you have all the companies in that sector. So the classic example is governments trying to understand traffic by working with data from ride-hailing companies, usually one of the big ones. Every company has a good idea about traffic, but the pooled data really gives you an idea about traffic in the whole country or the city. So it's really useful for the companies. But now imagine if government also pulls the data on the public bus service. That's now even more valuable, right? So there's really ways of incentivizing and value creation that you can think about. But this is not just about value creation. It's also about competition, keeping the doors open for the small players in particular, 
those who weren't in the negotiations in the first place in these partnerships to enter. That's good for competition, that's good for long term, and it's good for the development. The third is about policy and rules. Clarity on what can be shared, how and with whom is not obvious, particularly in the era that we have a lot of data protection regulations coming up. And that's an absolutely vital thing, right? And in fact, organizations that previously shared data together are now reluctant to do so because now suddenly there are new rules. But it is the role of governments to facilitate this policy environment around data sharing quite intentionally. Thanks. Really interesting. And I mean, as people speak, it's becoming more and more clear to me that one concept more than anything else is really standing out here as as the key to to widespread success of these types of initiatives. And that is the ecosystem and everything that it takes to create that ecosystem between public and private sector actors, um, you know, recognizing mutual value, having that enabling environment, which has both hard elements around policy and, and laws and guidance and those soft elements around skills development and network building and the rest of it. So some really interesting reflections so far. Um, Maurice, perhaps you could go next and, and just tell us um, what were one or two key recommendations that emerged from your research? Okay, um, thanks, uh, Tom. And um, I'm going to borrow Hilani's uh, term, intentionality. Um, so one of the key things that emerged, um, you know, it is, is interesting. It is apparent that many of the private sector organizations that we interacted with did not have F SDGs as an explicit motivating factor front of mind. Uh, even though it was relatively easy to align their programs, especially those focused on youth employability, livelihoods, quality education, you know, to associate those with the corresponding SDGs. But they were not driven by a desire to contribute to the SDGs. Um, we think that is important as a recommendation that the governments in the region need to be much more intentional in actively creating opportunities and vehicles for an ongoing dialogue with the private sector and other key partners regarding the opportunities for them to contribute to measuring, monitoring, and ultimately achieving the SDGs. At the moment, in many respects, it, it is just a reporting activity where they say, well, here's where we are a more deliberate, intentional focus on driving these engagements, I think can lead to greater participation and, and contributions. Um, the second quick thing I'll mention, Tom, as a recommendation is, again, back to the point you just made about the ecosystem approach. Uh, we, we found that a deliberate ecosystem approach um, above and beyond the conventional bilateral approach to partnerships lends itself very well to a much more scalable and much more self-sustaining data for development initiatives. So in our particular case, we found that the Trust for the Americas, in terms of the convening role that they played, um, facilitated very active, well-defined roles that other private sector actors, even small actors that potentially play an implementing role um, could play so that it opens up the, the whole sort of landscape for far more participation um, than sort of the traditional bilateral arrangements where you need um, big actors with deep pockets. Um, so that ecosystem approach is, is, is quite important and one that we certainly encourage governments to play a stronger facilitating role in, in, in encouraging that kind of arrangement. So those would be the two that I would highlight as recommendations. Perfect, Maurice. Thank you so much. And I, it, again, it's it's just the the what's really interesting to me, and, and this is getting ahead of ourselves as, to some degree. But what's really interesting to me is the is that despite operating in very different regions and undertaking re, um, research in very different reg regions, many of the themes are very very similar. And I think that that in in and of itself is a massive opportunity. And I'd love us to to discuss that in a few moments' time. Um, but before doing that, of course, um, Herman, does what you've heard so far resonate with you about the, the Latin America region? What are a couple of the recommendations that you have for stakeholders in that region?
We're just waiting for her mum to be unmuted. Try speaking. Can we hear you now? Now, now I am. Yeah, sorry, I was trying, but yeah, the host had to uh, unmute me. Uh, okay. Perfect. Well, as I said, I think that um, broadly speaking, there, there are two major I think determinants affecting the, the the private sector participation in in the in the data agenda for the SDGs in the region. Uh, I said the first one could be the, yes, the enabling environment uh, uh, that that could conduct to public and private initiatives. I I, I, I also think that in in Latin America, uh, and we have identified that the regulatory frameworks in general must evolve in order to support this practice and and the public and private data sharings and collaborations. In the second uh, uh, term, I could also highlight, as Maurice said, that uh, maybe the 2030 agenda has uh, lost a little bit of momentum and interest uh, by the private sector, and many of the initiatives are not not, not mainly focused to the to the 2030 agenda. Also, there are some initiatives, and I I, 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 I highlighted this also in, in my first intervention. But third, and, and this comes maybe from uh, our second case study, that it, it was a case study that presented a, a lessons of uh, a data a public good initiative uh, carried out by Dimaxion Lab, that is a, con a company that uh, worked with satellite images, and they have developed an app that uh, um, generates maps of, probable, uh, of, of slums and informal settlements. So one of the main lessons in that sense is they have been very successful partnering, partnering with the private sector and also, and also with the public sector. And uh, I would say that uh, for the data revolution, we have to understand that, that there are frameworks for the use of non-traditional data sources like this one that have been shown uh, everywhere uh, and have proven effectiveness and uh, have made beyond the, the experimental stages, because there are many things that are still in experimental stages. But in these cases, they are having concrete impact. And uh, this is the case of, for example, the satellitary uh, images, the interoperability of uh, administrative databases, the one I, I, I just also talk about, the use of scanner data. And uh, these efforts, what I think is that they should be um, should focus on the efforts on the international cooperation and the efforts on trying to enhance the data revolution should focus on these areas because they have already proven to be uh, successful so that this this would be also my contribution on on, on what recommendations i i would bring uh, this one to have an impact in the short term with things that have been already been working Excellent. over to you tom really they're just really interesting insights, as I said before, that have emerged because the, the, the there's so much similarity across um, across the different regions. But I'd love to hear a little bit more as well about um, what differences exist between the different regions when it comes to these types of partnership. So, Hernan, perhaps sticking with you, you know, in your first comments, um, you said, and this really struck me that there are data and initiatives, but a lack of data initiatives. Um, and I think that that's really good way of of expressing the the one of the challenges that we currently have so it, could you tell us a little bit more about um what's happening in the latin america region to to scale up data initiatives and and you know what's one of the points of diff what are a couple of the points of difference with the latin america region compared to what you've heard from from your colleagues as well what are some of the regional differences so a two a two sure. four question there just to clarify um what needs to happen to scale up and what are some of the regional um unique aspects of these types of partnership sure yes uh well uh, I, I i think yes it, it might be a little bit uh, um common within their regions but especially in latin america as i said they are they are data and their initiatives but there is a lack of data initiatives because the companies are more focused on uh, uh, reporting on, they are engaged with the 2030 agenda sometimes, they are engaged with the data uh, agenda sometimes, but we, what we are lacking is uh, 
these specific initiatives that somehow will strengthen the data ecosystem for reporting the 2030 agenda. This is what, what, what is more lacking or maybe the specificity in, in, in our region. The, the companies are getting involved, are getting involved in public-private uh, um, partnerships, but this is not that focused on the 2030 agenda. And in some cases, it is not that focused in strengthening the data ecosystems. Uh, sometimes you have isolated, um, you, we, we found isolated initiatives that maybe if uh, uh, they can uh, start working jointly or the government the governments can't start gathering private uh, sector companies as it happens within Chile. There you got it, uh, an example of how a government can uh, gather a lot of companies um, um, and, and, and have a, a concrete data initiative that is having impact and it's reducing cost and it's uh, streamlining a process. Uh, so bringing, again, bringing private sector data into uh, the public good and and and, and making uh, and strengthening the data ecosystem. So this this would be one uh, I think of the specificities in our region. And uh, maybe again the other one is uh, I think that uh, Latin America is uh, a little bit behind in terms of the institutional frameworks and, and 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 it has they have to evolve if we want to see more this more of these public and private uh, partnerships and. Uh, how they uh, enhance the data revolution for having better data. So th this would be the second specific for Latin America, that, that, that the region is a little bit behind. Thank you so much. And sticking to a geographically proximate region, <laughs> perhaps Maurice, you could, you could tell us a little bit more as well about um, some of the unique factors of the the Caribbean region when it comes to public private data initiatives you've touched on on a couple of themes already which I think are really interesting the first being um, the the very strong link in in the Caribbean region between public private data initiatives and the 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 skills building and capacity building components of of those um, uh, of those initiatives being a priority it would be really interesting to to hear a little bit more about why that is, what what the reason for that is, um, and also whether there are any other um, unique factors or points of difference in the Caribbean region that you'd like to highlight. Sure. Um, so, so you're right, Tom. The you know very often in the literature you see the Caribbean being characterized as as data poor, and and that has to do with the extent to which we have good quality. Um, public uh, open data, open data initiatives have stalled in many respects. And also the extent to which um, in the public sector um, and in the private sector, data is being used effectively to drive both policy and decision making. Um, so when I compare the Caribbean's mapping activity that we did with the larger population of mapping activities across my colleagues and the other regions, it was clear that for us, the, 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 by far, the dominant data action related to education and training in digital and data skills, uh, usually in combination with, um, you know, a propensity for employability and uh, community development. So clearly, there's a very strong uh, sort of well, perception and policy resonance among national stakeholders and international development partners that for the Caribbean, enabling youth empowerment and employability through digital and data capacity building is, is extremely important to the policy agenda at this point in time. And is seen as something that can help to build a, a kind of resilience against, um, you know, unattached or high-risk youth becoming you know, victims and or perpetrators of, of crime and violence. So that it is an important part of the agenda at this point, and it's not surprising that the majority of the data actions that we saw um, and the majority of the resonance with the private sector that we saw related to this kind of digital literacy and data capacity building. Um, I, I would say, uh, Tom, and it actually relates to a recommendation I might have made earlier that as we see this systematic investment in capacity building, we'd also like to see the private sector and private sector actors in the region, expanding the range of data actions beyond capacity building and looking at more uh, sort of value-added activities. Um, so 
you know, transferring actionable data to the public sector or providing services like AI that can help the public sector's ability to um, extract insights from its own data repositories. So I think this is one of the things as a recommendation we'd like to see going forward. I mean, obviously the systematic capacity building is, is important and it's uh, sort of, um, you know, a first level set of initiatives, but we have to begin to look beyond that, to look further up the value chain and to build on those kinds of um, capabilities. Perfect. Thank you, Maurice. There's there's a lot to there's a lot to do there, but I do I do think that the um, the focus on on capacity building and digital skills, etc., is a really strong foundation. So I think that you know it's a good starting place, even as as you say, um, there's also a moment now, and it's time to move up the value chain. Um, but I think it's a good it's a good starting place. Um, Helani, perhaps you could share some insights with us. Um, as well about the the some of the unique aspects that you came across in the in the East Asia region. Um, so over to you. Thank you, Tom. I'm actually not sure if any of this is unique because I heard things that are very common to our region in both the two previous speakers. But I guess the difference, for example, is if you look at Asia, so South and Southeast Asia that we looked at. Instead of capacity building, data sharing was the most common partnership initiative that we saw. Uh, for example, our mapping study looked at 52 such instances in just 14 countries involving private sector and mostly related to cl uh, climate change, right? Um, so the first, I mean, the thing I think, again, quite common is skill and awareness of the value of data and the ability to manipulate and use this data. This is still quite low. And I think this is in part why we have these one-off initiatives that start with great fanfare. So, um, you know, governments are still in the early stages and, you know, they think these partnerships and the way we use data and the models can be taken from a very developed country without customization. That is not how it works. Uh, we are resource poor, the language algorithms don't work, we have much smaller sets of data and so on, all the challenges apart from skill, right? So really that has to be developed. And governments have a hard time engaging with private sector too, instead of just seeing them as a, you know, organization that sponsors something, partnerships are quite difficult to build with government in the region. Um, statistics officers are mandated to collect census data and extrapolate and may not have the policy frameworks um, in South Asia to actually use private sector data like telecom data in between censuses to work on it. So there are all these challenges that they need to overcome. I think there's also an opportunity. Ironically, if we look at a lot of the partnerships, uh, you know, the really successful ones have come at these pivotal crisis moments, right? COVID was one, one of the speakers touched upon it. Suddenly you saw, you know, Facebook and all the telecom companies talking and working with government to understand movement data. The Nepal earthquake really brought together expertise, I think, from Flowminder and the mobile telecom companies to understand, you know, the effects of the earthquake in a way no other data could, right? So, I mean, if you are looking for crisis, South Asia has enough. And I was just thinking, you know, while Erdan was talking, you know, I mean, Sri Lanka is going through an economic crisis with very high inflation and not really being able to get a handle quantitatively. So, I mean, surely we should be not just looking to the north, but looking at the south-south cooperation of the kind of example that he talked about and use that kind of implementation in a country like Sri Lanka, right? Which I think would be doable if somebody is willing to sort of negotiate that. Thanks. That's a really, really interesting point and a really interesting insight. And I think the the one of the big it's something that hasn't been raised so far in this conversation, um, but I think is is hugely valuable that you know south south knowledge transfer um, when it comes to to data initiatives. I think is is potentially a really big opportunity. Um, last but not least, I'd like to invite Leonida back to the stand as well um, and to share just very briefly a couple of insights um about some of the unique um features uh, and regional attributes of of the partnerships in east africa i 
I can't hear. I'm not sure. Can others hear? Leonida? Hello. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yep. We can, can hear, hear you now. now. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I was saying that um, I'd, one of the unique aspects of the sort of partnerships we mapped and reviewed in, in this region um, that I'd like to highlight is on the issue of um, these partnerships addressing very unique, I mean, very niche um, problems, uh, uh, problem sets. So for instance, I talked about the GIS lab that's been established in a very specific region um, within Kenya. Uh, another initiative that we also came across was um, you know, the drone um, delivery services for health and mapping in Rwanda. Um, like these use cases are very unique to, to each of these contexts and face the issue of scalability, one, but secondly, um, the data that is in use by these partnerships are actually, uh, most of them that we observed are from multinationals, primarily because I think they do have the resourcing and the um, legal framework to support data sharing and data usage beyond private sector use, which is something that um, startup companies or smaller uh, private sector entities within the region may not have those frameworks to support the usage or even the muscle to work with um, either government or large public institutions to use data. So uh, one thing that we think um, is important, and we have also seen this as an example from the Bureau of Statistics in Kenya, is a very um, a very clearly spelled out framework of utilizing private data for more um, national or public um, public goods, in this case, supporting the development goals. Um, these frameworks are in the form of guidances on how, if you are producing, how small of a player you are in the ecosystem, uh, data sets that can be utilized beyond the usual surveys and the usual census. Um, provides guidance on how you can streamline it for statistics purposes and for development purposes. So I think um, those frameworks can support other actors coming into the space, but also producing more data beyond the niche um, use cases that uh, we, we saw working in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leonida. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion so far. We only have a couple of minutes. I do want to just very briefly open the floor to see whether we have any um, any reflections perhaps from the audience. I don't think we have enough time for or for questions, but if anyone has any very, very brief reflections they'd like to share, please do jump in. Um, and that invitation also extends to, um, to some of the panelists and to Philip as well, who gave opening remarks um, earlier. So over to you. And in the meantime, I'm just going to share my screen briefly and um, highlight a URL um, where you can find more information about this project. But from me, thank you so much um, to every to everybody and to the organizers um, and I'll come back in a moment just to say goodbye um, but over to to comments from um, the audience Tom since we have two minutes left on our official Please. program yeah. uh, <clears throat> maybe uh, we, we can wrap it up with the reflections of what comes of course next and what a clear uh, and agreed vision of success uh, for 2030 looks like from a data revolution perspective and this is not only seen uh, by researchers but by the companies itself uh, so this stock taking exercises uh, that identify actually those uh, strengths to the weaknesses, it's what a meaningful uh, way forward and have a, a action plan that actually enables uh, data as a political and uh, good governance issue, and especially uh, that we have a stronger progress in enabling uh, of responsible public-private uh, partnerships. And I think uh, we saw very important examples today of how this is done. We still have um, a long way to go because the missing link that we still 
still need, uh, it's actually the uh, possibility uh, to move forward uh, with the private sector towards 2030. But we, as you mentioned, within a policy framework and a self-house cooperation among practitioners that helps us to move forward. So this was uh, within the 30 seconds I was given uh, the answer, Tom, and over to you. Thank you, colleagues and people in uh, China who have accompanied us here today. Uh, it has really been a good opportunity for us to share our knowledge and hopefully it has been helpful for you as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Philip, for the for that um, overview of, of what comes next and, and some of the links to further initiatives. From my side, we're now at the hour. Um, I'd just like to thank the panelists um, so much for, for taking the time to share their insights. Um, <laughs> for some of our panelists, um, it's very, very early in the morning, so thank you so much for, for taking the time. And I'd also just like to take a moment to thank the organizers um, of the World Data Forum um, for hosting us. Um, on the URL um, that is, it, hopefully you can see on the screen before you, um, you will find all the case studies and mapping work um, relating to this project. The mapping work is already uploaded. The case studies are fresh off the press and will be uploaded to the website in the very near future. So please do keep a lookout for updates. So from me, thank you so much and um, back to the organizers. Bye bye, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.